This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Ricardo Spagni, aka Fluffy Pony, and Naveen Jain of Tari. Douglas, Ricardo, and Naveen discuss the recent launch of Tari's testnet, the challenges they had to overcome, and what they plan to achieve with this alpha stage release. The team also explains how Tari's protocol is geared towards building real-world applications and how its main goal is to be an active and positive contributor to the Monero ecosystem. Monero Talk starts now. Guys, Tari, thanks for coming on. How you guys doing? What are you drinking? Whiskey. Whiskey? I thought you were a wine guy. What happened to the whole... And where's the wine rack? Oh, the, the, the wine rack. The, you the, the wine, wine already? You, you've killed... The wine rack's behind this wall. It's there. It's just okay. not behind me right now. It's in front of me, kind of. Okay. He has exactly. a he has a secret wall. You push a button, and it, it's kind of James Bond like. It kind of just moves. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I'm just yeah. waiting. I'm waiting to install a whiskey wall. <laughs> yeah. Then, then I know I've made it. <laughs> so what's going on, guys? How's uh, how's Tari going? How's the how was the launch, the test that launch? Uh, I mean, I think it went well. Yeah. Did you get good feedback? Yeah, we're getting really great feedback. I think, uh, you know, pe- people are checking it out. That What more can you ask for with a test net launch? So people are playing with it and giving us feedback and you know, getting involved. So it's, it's cool. It's cool to see that. How, how was the uh, kind of the experience from conception to now birth over here? Is it, uh, did it live up to your expectations? Was it more difficult than you thought it would be? Did you actually produce what you set out to produce at this point? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I, I can speak from a technical perspective. Um, it was very challenging. You know, there's writing something like this from scratch and not just hitting fork on GitHub is like, it's, it's both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you can like really revisit those architectural decisions and go, how should we build this? Um, if we got to make all the decisions, what, you know, how should we build the logging? How should we, uh, I mean, and sometimes basic things like what versioning system um, should we use, you know? And, and you get to make all those decisions uh, with really bright people and as a community. So not just like, you know, Tari Labs, but we kept having these discussions on IRC with um, this very nascent community, largely of people who um, are fans of, of Monero. Um, and, uh, and that really helped refine the decision-making progress, process. But then the actual building of it, man, it is, it is a lot of work. It is a massive undertaking. Um, we knew it was going to be a big undertaking, but I think the sheer volume of, of effort has really, it's floored me. And it's a testament to, to all the contributors that have worked on it, that we managed to launch testnet, um, relatively quickly, actually, if you, if you consider how hard these things are. So how many people are like actually really actively contributing? How many guys or guys, gals, uh, actually Put effort into the right code here. I mean, I can I can open up the yeah I can open up the Tari repo and tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just just on the main Tari repo, there's been 16 contributors. Um, but obviously, the the mobile wallet is a is a different project, and uh, there's some people who've contributed to the iOS wallet and the Android wallet who haven't contributed to anything else. Uh, iOS has got nine contributors and the Android wallet has got six. So I'd say, I mean, all in, we're, we're most likely looking at around 20 to 25 people that have, um, that have worked on it. And that's really cool to see. 
Great. And, and are some of them being funded by you and some of them are just kind of, well, what's the situation? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the, the nice thing about, um, about Tari is um, the opportunity to build an application on Tari is kind of more, or, or utilize Tari to, to build something is kind of more intuitively obvious. Um, then with Monero, where if you're building a company around Monero, you're building it around Monero, the currency. If you're building something on Tari, you don't care about, you know, any underlying token. You care about, um, you know, whatever your, you, whatever asset you're going to issue on Tari. And so that means that um, companies that are, that, that are planning on building on Tari or companies that are planning on switching infrastructure to Tari have a vested interest in making the Tari protocol a success. Um, and, and we're starting to see that play out. And I think we will see that play out more and more um, a, as people pitch up and go, oh, hey, I'm here to work on Tari. Uh, and, you, you know, you sort of connect the dots. And you're like, oh, okay, that's where you're from. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's exciting times. And I think we're, I, I'm, I'm excited to see the, the um, group of contributors grow. Obviously, there's a strong South African contingent right now, which is great. Um, but you know, we're starting to see people from Russia, from the U S from all over, um, uh, Eastern Europe that are starting to, to contribute. So yeah, it's, uh, it's starting to become a little bit more global and a little bit less, um, you know, Hey, these are people that I know. Right. Right. Great. So what, what can people do on Tari today? I know it's a test net, but like what, what is Tari capable of at this point? They can spend fake money to buy socks. That's um, yeah, uh, not, not too much. They can, um, play with, uh, this, you know, sort of test net, uh, Tari token, you know, uh, send it back and forth. Um, and then we created this little store, uh, type thing called, uh, uh Tari Testnet limited, which is, you know, sort of like limited edition swag that people can buy, uh, with their, with their fake tokens. Um, and so that that's basically what they can do right now. So can they just, build the digital assets yet on top of Tart? Is that no, okay. uh, not not yet. So the way we're thinking about this is sort of a, a multi-layered system. So in order for this to be successful, you have to have a very strong foundation. You have to make sure that the foundation actually works, um, that it's you know stable, robust, uh, etc. And so um, we're really just kind of like focused on as a community you know we're focused on just making that reality and then you know from that point forward you know additional complexity will be added which will allow for digital asset assurance yeah and I, just to add to that um again you know sort of from a from a technical perspective um part of the goal of testnet is to really iron out uh, the, the bugs in running that that underlying network before you start adding the complexity of um, of the sort of additional layer above it, and I th I think um, having gone through the throes of the first few weeks of testnet, the really testnet was like it was kind of in a state where it worked for us, like for you know the the contributors that were that were playing around um, and setting up like private testnets and and reg tests and that sort of thing. Um, and when you, when you go public, that's when the, the, the kinks really get ironed out. Um, and it was like, like it was really rough compared to where it is now, just in a, in a couple of weeks of having feedback from random people on all sorts of infrastructure, all sorts of internet connections, various devices, you know, that are downloading and running the software and then providing feedback, you know, and sometimes the feedback is, like a little bit brutal, but it's like an early alpha. You know, that's that's sort of my my um, analog in my mind is it's not a beta, it's an alpha, it's early stage stuff. Um, it looks really beautiful for early stage stuff, but that's the reality. And you, as long as you are prepared for that, then you you just see this like plethora of improvements as things get, get um, reported on, uh, discovered and fixed, which is great. So are you guys just kind of like heads down working on the code or are you guys thinking other things too, like how to bring in, you know, partners, people that can, can use Tari once it's, once it's fully built? Are you there yet? Or? 
D Doug, are you are you implying that we're one dimensional people? Not at all. I'm the opposite. <laughs> I was leading you to to tell me how you how you're. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my perspective on this question is that, um, you know, we just want to create something useful. You know, like we just want ultimately people to find that this thing creates value for them and um, helps them achieve the goals that they have. So um, I would say that we're always out there talking to people that may find, you know, uh, the Atari protocol to be useful at some point in the future. Um, obviously it's incredibly early today. It's super nascent, um, but you know, we're, we're always talking to people and, and, and people are reaching out to us. You know, people, you know, post up in, on Telegram or in IRC or, you know, wherever um, and, and ask questions and, and poke and prod at this, at this, uh, you know, very early stage thing called Tari. And, um, and so we're learning a lot, you know, we're learning a lot from those conversations. And that's part of the, one of the sort of traditions of the project is that, you know, it's, it's a very open, inclusive type of thing. So, you know, want to really learn from as many people as are interested in, in, you know, contributing and participating in the community. So like, I know Big Neon was one of the kind of going to be one of the first apps. Is that something that's, uh, is that still making progress? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, uh, it's really hard for, uh, for tickets to be sold during a pandemic. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, that, that, that challenge aside, which is obviously a very meaningful one, uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's a really cool project. It has a lot of potential. And ultimately, you know, I, I think the folks that are working on Big Neon believe that it, it can derive a lot of value from Tari in the future. So um, in terms of, you know, issuing tickets as digital assets on Tari. Um, and, you know, again, you know, some of the, the thinking that folks have is that, you know, why not have, you know, reference design applications out there that kind of just show people how this thing might work someday. I mean, that's why there's a, a very early stage, you know, mobile wallet for Tari now, right? Like the reason why that exists is because it's intended to be a reference design that, you know, others might go, hey, I, the way they did that is really cool. And maybe they can apply it to something else. They can apply it to Monero. They can apply it to some, some other project. You know, everything that uh, is being developed around Tari is, is completely open source. So, um, so that, that's part of the thinking in terms of, how to achieve this goal of making something useful is to actually dog food a little bit um, around the project. You know, it's like, okay, can folks that are connected to the Tari project in some way create things that are useful that are not just, you know, things that people in the crypto world care about, you know, things that regular people care about. Um, and, and hopefully that's true one day. Yeah, and, and I think the, um... The sort of thing that we're seeing um, is that a lot of the interest uh, in building on Tari is less stuff targeted at crypto people and more like real world applications, um, uh, game developers that are thinking about uh, how to issue assets in their game, that sort of thing. And that's quite exciting because I think um, I think it's important to you know to, to not just have a crypto project for crypto people. That, that sort of seems to be a means to an end. This is a, a protocol project and it's building a protocol for real world applications. And so I, I know we've talked about in this past, but I guess, what, so why would game developers look to Tari uh, as opposed to something like Ethereum or you know, one of these other tools out there or cryptos out there? Why, why, why would they choose Tari as their platform? I think, um, and I mean, it's, uh, I think that, that the best example of uh, the lessons learned paradigm is um, a company like Dapper Labs that did build on Ethereum very successfully. They built CryptoKitties. Like, like, isn't that like the, one of the most successful dApps that has ever existed? Okay, it's like 30 daily active users now, but it used to be successful at one point. <laughs> and, and I mean, like now they're building their own chain. Why? Why not just use Ethereum? You know, I mean, like Ethereum made you money and got you invest, got you uh, VC interest. Why? Why eschew Ethereum for your own chain? It's because everything out there 
currently, um, or at least like until now, has disappointed them. Uh, and I think a lot of game developers and, and digital asset creators will go through the same process. They'll be like, oh, yes, we need to you know, put stuff on chain. Reddit's doing that now. Oh, we need to issue token, our, our, our loyalty points, our Reddit points on chain. Okay, on a blockchain. Blockchain is cool. I love blockchain. We should do this. Oh, what blockchain should we use? I don't know. Let's use this Ethereum thing. We can just click and issue a token. It's right there. The, the example on how to use Ethereum. The first example is create your own token. Okay, cool. We've created our own token. Five minutes later, oh, our token's been hacked because we just, you know, copy pasted a smart contract. Um, or it doesn't have the throughput. Bedore, Ethereum 2.0 is coming with Beacon Jane. And, and people will eventually get tired of that. Like, let's be, let, let's be real here. Serious engineers, serious software engineers building real-world products at the scale um, that Reddit is working at, they're going to tire of bottlenecks very quickly. And they're just not going to put up with it and they're going to move on. So it's, it's sad but true that there needs to be something that is built with the idea of, um, you know, scalability and uh, uh, asset creators first in mind. And that's really Tari's focus. It's, it's not to try and compete with Ethereum. You know, it's not to try and be a world computer. It's how do we serve our users, our primary users, which are digital asset creators. Yeah, um, just to add to that too, uh, I also think that it's, it's really hard to live in a world without default privacy um, if you're a business owner. I mean, businesses thrive on privacy. You, know, you, don't, you don't reveal your customer list or how much money you've made from a given asset or you just don't do any of that in the real world. I mean, this idea that people are gonna use surveillance chains to build businesses is, is really a stupid idea. I mean, it's just dumb. It doesn't make any sense. And, and I think the idea comes from people who've never built a business before. Um, so anyone who's actually built a successful business knows that privacy is a critical part of running a successful business. And so, you know, that's obviously one of the key, you know, sort of elements of um, sort of the, the, the vision for the Tari project is that, you know, they're there can be this concept of, of default privacy around digital assets that are issued on um, ultimately in the future on the Tari protocol. Um, so that, that's another side of it. And then, and then the other thing I would add is that uh, as Ricardo mentioned, you know, it's, it's really important to have things you can look to that are actually working in the real world. So, you know, you mentioned Big Neon, you can look at the, the, super early reference wallet application, you know, this Tari Aurora thing. Um, you can look at these things and go, gosh, you know, these are things that real world people might be able to use someday because they're not crypto centric. It's, you know, it's not, you know, it doesn't have all of the elements that people would expect um, who really live in this space on a daily basis. And that's intentional. That's really intentional because guess what? The rest of the world doesn't care about what kind of database you're using. Right? They just, no one cares. It's not like you go to a website and they advertise, oh, we, we're using Postgres. You know, we're using MySQL. No one does that. So why would anyone want to advertise what distributed database uh, system you know, that they're using? It just doesn't make any sense. So I, I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to trade-offs. Um, and I think the Tari community is, is making some intentional decisions around trade-offs. And, and who knows if those are the right trade-offs to make? I mean, we don't know. This is an early, early stage project, and it's a super early stage community. So, the time will tell. So, I, I know the big question from everybody in the in the well, not everybody, but a lot of people in the Monero community. You, you've answered it in many different ways, but I'll ask it now because there might be people tuning in that kind of learn about this stuff for the first time. How does Monero benefit from Tari? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's the first time you heard it. So, yeah, it's, you know, first time I've ever had to had to answer this. So I, I think it's important to understand that um, th there there has to be a reciprocal relationship here, because Tari is benefiting from Monero. We benefit from Monero security. Okay, no one can stop us from merge mining, but I, I certainly don't want to have a scenario where we're viewed as hostile and and we're trying to. Um, convince miners to, to merge mine. 
Um, so, so, you know, we benefit from Tari security. We definitely have benefited, benefited from, um, the interest from, uh, Monero, the Monero community, even just having like Monero contributors in the, Monero, in the Tari dev room, um, has been great. And, and by the way, I'd like to point out that this is not dissimilar from, um, over the past few years where Monero has had Bitcoin contributors and Bitcoin core devs in Monero Dev and in the Monero Research Lab channel. And there's been an interchange of ideas. Even some Grin developers have, uh, have hovered around and been able to help Monero, uh, especially Monero Research Lab. So we, we should encourage that. I mean, that's a, that's a good thing. It's made Monero better to have Bitcoin developers there. And it's, uh, it's going to make Tari better to have Monero developers around. They're not contributing code. They're just there so that when you mention something, hey, I think we can do this, that they'll pipe up and go, oh, that's a dumb idea because I, we try to do that once in a project I worked on 10 years ago and it was dumb. You know, that, that sort of thing really helps. So obviously Tari's benefiting, but, but uh, Monero can benefit too. And Monero does benefit right now. So there's some obvious things. Tari Labs pays for the CDN that serves all the Monero downloads. Um, and uh, the important thing about the CDN, it's a very, very expensive CDN. Uh, I, I, I need to double check, but I think it's four or four and a half thousand dollars a month. The reason we have such an expensive CDN is partly the volume of downloads, but mostly because the CDN that we use has got um, points inside China to serve Monero downloads behind the Chinese firewall. Now you pay for the privilege. It's expensive. Um, and we would, we, we certainly are, uh, like like Tari Labs appreciates that Monero as a um, as a privacy enhancing and a self sovereign uh, self sovereign enhancing self sovereignty enhancing um, uh, project. It's important to have those endpoints in China so that people can get the software without anyone even knowing that they're downloading the software because it's just you know hitting some server in China. And this, this CDN has got like 19 servers, uh, server farms in China or servers in China. So it's, it's pretty key. Um, now, there's that. And that's sort of like an immediate benefit. The other immediate benefit is Tari Labs um, has been spending money on uh, CCS proposals. Just like, you know, we, we let the community take that initial uh, uh, shot at it. And then when we see it starts to hit that plateau, you know, like there's this initial run of funding and then like, people start running a little bit dry and the funding proposals like 60% or 70% there, then we come in and we just close the gap. Um, and we try and mention when we do so that there's a little bit of transparency and people can see that we're not trying to buy um, CCS proposals. We're just trying to make sure that they get filled. Um, otherwise they can, you know, it's, it's, there's uncertainty with the CCS sometimes for individual contributors that especially when they're waiting for like, three months worth of funding or whatever. And then they're like, Oh, am I actually going to get this you know, before the market shifts entirely? Um, and that's the right now stuff, the future stuff uh, where, where Tari can help Monero. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of things like um, we've, we've got these beautiful designs that we've done for the wallet. Um, and now we're looking at ways of, um, of, of putting them on Figma, um, you know, making sure that the, the actual, underlying design work is available so that somebody working on a, uh, on the Monero GUI or on a Monero mobile wallet can go and pick just the design patterns, pull those into their project, reuse those design patterns, benefit from all the UX work that we've done. And it's extensive UX work for, for the mobile wallets in particular. Uh, we haven't even touched a desktop wallet yet. Um, and, and then of course there's the, the sort of far future. Um, and we have this vision, which, I don't know if we'll ever do it. It's just an idea, but we have this vision for like um, some sort of, uh, of um, dev center or a series of, okay, originally it was physical dev centers, but given the pandemic, I think physical dev centers go out the window. Um, but, you know, at least having some sort of, of dev center style thing where people can apply and uh, for grants almost and say, I'd like to build something on Monero or on Tari or on both, I'd like to add this feature. I'd like to, you know, build this wallet, build this thing, whatever it is. And it's going to take me six months or a year. Um, the grants are will typically, I would imagine, be short, like probably six months um, uh, at a time, maybe even shorter. Um, and uh, and then you get the funding in order to build that for that period. And that's it. The the grant is given to you or paid out on a on a monthly basis. 
um, as long as you're able to show that you're, you know, you're fulfilling um, the commitments of your grant. Um, I'd imagine that any sort of grant approval process would have a committee that is formed uh, from community members from within the Monero community and within the Tari community. Um, so yeah, the grant approval process would be centralized by that committee, but it, the idea would be that it isn't um, a Tari labs approval process. It's a, a committee and that gets given funding and gets, you know, they have to use it judiciously uh, through something like that. And I think that that could provide an interesting alternative, not, not a replacement for the CCS at all, but an interesting alternative, especially for ecosystem projects. The CCS is very, very key for core protocol, for core GUI, for website, for translations, for those sort of things. But broader ecosystem projects sometimes suffer because to go to the, the CCS, and I've done it, to go to the CCS and say, hey, we've got this thing that we think will have a knock-on effect, a knock-on benefit, excuse me, <coughs> a knock-on benefit for Monero, but maybe isn't that easy to measure, then that's really hard to raise funding through the CCS. Yeah, um, just to add a, a couple of things to um, what Ricardo said, um, you know, another project that's near term that um, Tari Labs is uh, spearheading um, is, uh, you know, we're working on this concept of a legal framework uh, for, um, you know, for privacy oriented digital currency projects, obviously with Monero as sort of the primary, primary focus. Um, and, and that's a really important project because at the end of the day, there's some really interesting things that are happening out there with regulators all over the world. You know, there, there are these statements that are made sometimes by regulators that, believe it or not, are actually not uh, based on any sort of like, you know, uh, uh, judgment in court. You know, it's, it's, there's no case law for some of the statements that are made. They just kind of make things up, you know, because they're regulators. Um, and so there are these, all these statements that have been made, uh, you know, by regulators that say, well, exchange, you can't list a, a privacy, uh, private, a default private uh, digital currency project like Monero because, you know, because of the travel rule, because of, you know, whatever, whatever the, the rule is. And um, we think it's really important for there to be a framework out there that people in our space can use to understand and parse um, what is uh, hyperbole from a regulator or, you know, just sort of a statement from a regular, regulator and what's the actual fact of the matter. And uh, without having to spend boatloads of money, um, you know, with their own legal counsel to try to get to the same answers. And so, um, you know, that's another thing that we're spending a lot of time and effort on right now. Um, and, and the primary beneficiary for that work um, that we're, we're working on is, is Monero. You know, that, that's part of the reason why we're, we're doing this because we really think it's super important. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, we're, we're, we're just, a, we're part of this ecosystem, this ecosystem that cares about um, privacy as a basic human right and um, really wants uh, default privacy to be sort of the, 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 the standard um, out there. And Monero has earned trust over a meaningful amount of time um, as the de facto best in class default private digital currency project in the world. And so from our point of view, um, you know, folks in Volwatari are not interested in taking anything away from that at all. You know, we want to be as accretive to that as possible. So how, how do you onboard, you know, millions and millions and millions of new people into Monero? How do you do that? You know, it's a good question. And, and there's a million opinions. There's so many great opinions and so many great ideas in there out there on how to do that. Um, and, and there's ideas that folks involved with the Tari project have, you know, related to that. Um, you know, thinking about Tari is essentially effectively a kind of bridge um, to get folks into Monero because, you know, as it's been very clearly stated by folks involved with the Tari project, Tari doesn't have the same privacy guarantees that Monero has. It, it, it never will. Um, you know, it, it's default private to a point. Uh, and as we all know, privacy is a spectrum. So, um, so I think, I think from, from our, my point of view, um, I view this as, uh, it, it's a, it's a symbiotic project. Um, some people are not going to agree with that. Some people are going to view it differently than that. And that's fine. Everyone is obviously entitled to their opinion and, uh, hopefully trust is earned with time. You know, we, can't expect people just to go, oh, you know, trust those Tari 
community people. They're great people. It's like, well, okay, we'll, we'll just show you over time that, you know, like we really care deeply about the Monero community and the Monero ecosystem. And we want to be active, positive contributors to the ecosystem in, in a number of ways. Some, you know, a number of the ways that we've uh, expressed in this conversation and, and many, many more in the future, you know, things that we've not even thought about yet. So, so that's, that's my perspective on that question. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little funny, you know, people are like concerned that you guys are doing X, Y, and Z. I mean, it's, you know, this is all open source stuff. You know, you guys, you guys are working on Kari project right now. This is what you're interested in. And, you know, obviously not abandoning Monero, but I'm just saying like the fact that people have certain expectations of you is, you know, you guys are, you're, you're doing whatever it is you want to do. I mean, that's what this is all about, right? So um, you guys are, are going down the yeah. road and I, I, I do, I do see a lot of these potential benefits and, and the symbiosis. And uh, but for those that are that are bitter about it, I mean, it, this, that's not how this, this sector works, right? This is all like yeah. open source. People are, are doing things, they're creating new projects, and it's it's all you know, you know, rising tide raises all ships or whatever whatever the, whatever the quote is. That you want to use. Like, and, and you know, it's all, Doug, it's all I, good things. that's it. And and the thing I'd like to add is. Um, I I have worked on Monero since early 2014, so since since it's in, in uh, inception, and not only have I spent uh, an inordinate amount of money uh, of my personal money, but I've also just you know spent 16 hour days on it for years before Monero was uh, was a thing when there were like maybe a hundred people in the community at at its peak, um, and I can't imagine slaving that much for no reward, no real reward. Um, and, and in fact, more abuse than anything from, from some people, um, only to then throw it all away by trying to compromise it like some sort of state grade attacker, you know, that, that with an attack that people would see right through and, and that they'd be able to thwart pretty easily. It would be ludicrous. So this is about, benefiting Tari and benefiting Monero by extension. Um, what's good for Monero is good for Tari and what's good for Tari, I hope will be good for Monero. And, and that's the plan. How about these people that are like calling Tari labs, the, uh, the block stream of, of Monero. I mean, what's your response to that? You know, well, I think sometimes that stuff's predicated on, on blockstream being bad, which is the first, that, like that's a point for discussion. Um, like what specifically has blockstream done that's bad? You know, they, they don't pay for all of the core developers. In fact, they pay for like a small fraction of them, a handful of them. Um, they've, you know, put some sat or, or, or paid for some satellite bandwidth for you to get Bitcoin blocks. And they put out like, green wallet, which is, I think is a pretty decent uh, Bitcoin mobile wallet. And like, what else have they done? That's I, I can't, I actually don't understand what they've done. That's bad. But even if we assume that somehow blockstream are, are pure evil and, and they are poisoning Bitcoin with a satellite bandwidth, like how does that all at all relate? You know, like, like Tari labs is working on Tari, you know, by extension, we want to, hopefully help Monero in some way. Um, and we've got some ideas around that, but our primary focus, frankly, uh, at Tari Labs is Tari. The clue is in the name. It's not called Monero Labs. So, you know, our, our focus is not positively or negatively um, on, on Monero. Our focus is on Tari. And we appreciate that Tari benefits from Monero's existence and needs Monero to succeed in order for, for Tari to be secure at the very least, that is bare minimum. And so we want to make Monero better, but it's not by trying to control Monero. That would just defeat the purpose. In fact, that would make Monero insecure, which would then affect Tari's underlying security model. Yeah, I, I also think that um people are very good at making up stories and you know, they can make up whatever stories they want. And, and the thing that people have to remember about stories is that the opposite of whatever story you're making up can be just as true. You, it's a story you've made up. So um, I don't have any problem with people making up stories. Well, now, all, now, you're, now you're going the fake news approach. You're doing, you're doing the Trump here. Is this, is this no, I'm just, I'm just saying <laughs> it's, it's true, right? Like 
people are going to say whatever they're going to say. Yeah. And, and all we can do is stay focused on what we're doing and hopefully through action, earn people's trust. That's all we can do. And you can't hack earning trust. We recognize that. We're not trying to. There's there's no goal here. There's no uh, you know perspective from myself or others on the team that we're gonna somehow you know buy people's trust. It's like look, it just we're gonna just keep plodding along, doing our thing. We want to make meaningful contributions to Monero. We have no interest in buying you know control of any kind over Monero. It's not of interest in any way, shape, or form. To Ricardo's point, it's actually would adversely impact everything that we're working towards and you know hopefully one day there's a lot more people who are engaged with Monero and love Monero and are passionate about Monero through some of the efforts that we were a part of and hopefully that's true one day and even at that point in time even if objectively some people in the community in the Monero community could look at that and say gosh you know we actually did a study you know on this date and time this was what was going on in the Monero community. And now fast forward to this date and time, this is what's happening in the, in the Monero community. And we, we think that Tari Labs and the Tari community made some meaningful impact in this, in this result. There's still gonna be people out there who make up stories. That's just the nature of communities and that's perfectly fine. So we're totally okay with it. People are always welcome to have their uh, opinions. And our, our dream, our hope is that over time, we can just earn more and more people's trust through our actions. The, uh, let's, if you could just step back, the open source listing framework, um, what kind of progress have we seen there? Do we know, are we, are we almost at a, at a point where uh, you'll be releasing that framework? Yeah, um, so you're talking about the legal, the legal framework? Yeah, yes, um, yes. we're making awesome progress. Um, we've been working very closely with, uh, with a, a law firm called Perkins Cooey um, on this, and um, they're you know, a pretty well-known uh, fairly large law firm um, that is uh, very, very talented at these sorts of things. Um, you know, we've enlisted the help of former regulators. We've gotten feedback from regulators. Like, this is a real thing. We're really trying to create something that's useful. You know, uh, if, if, if it's just a, if it's not worth the paper that it's printed on, then it was a waste of time. And that's dumb. So, um, I don't have a specific date for you. I'm like, oh, hey, you know, on this date and time, it's going to be available. But uh, I, I think we're making good progress and hopefully soon. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure everybody in the narrow community will be very excited to see that document. Uh, us too. Is, um, I know that as the members of the Monero community. Sorry, go ahead. And, and yeah, sorry, just, just to add to that, that they are some. Oh, you guys are members? Uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> There are some, some existing contributors, um, uh, well-known people in the Monero ecosystem who are involved more on the, the regulatory and legal side who are participating in the process of, of creating this document. So it's not just Tari Labs. It's not just um, the law firms that we've engaged. Justin, it's also, you know, Justin individuals. You out, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Justin and others. Um, and, and so this is a, an iterative process. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that the document is broad enough to be useful to exchanges, but narrow enough that it's useful for, for Monero. Yeah, and also we want to make sure that it, it, it receives the impact factor, right? So, um, you know, that's also part of it is, you know, what's the strategy to actually make sure it has some impact out there in the world. So, you know, there's a number of things that are in the works related to this project um, for the folks that are working on it. And, you know, Justin is uh, someone who's, played an instrumental role um, in, 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 that, in that project's development. So we're very fortunate that he's uh, decided to invest his time and effort. Uh, another one that's always asked is the, the emission uh, schedule for Tari. Has there been any further development there as to what that might look like? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, like, I'd imagine it'll be like at least one Tari a day. I don't know, I might be. <laughs> <laughs> one per day no you know what you know what it's um just getting maybe maybe taking a step back and going back to that whole discussion of like what's it like building something like this from scratch um 
there's this this discussion around a mission schedule which you don't really get to have with Bitcoin or with Monero, right? Because someone else made the decision. We don't know how Satoshi got to the decision. We definitely don't know how Thank for Today got to any decisions, much less the emission schedule. You know, I think he like picked a random value or just like accepted that whatever was in Bitcoin was going to be in Monero with like slight tweaks. Um, and I think, I think we can do better. I think that we can actually seriously think about this. I, I feel like tail emission is necessary because that's that's been, I th you know, I mean, like like we did that for Monero, and and that was a decision that that we took early on, shortly after forking. Um, I had read a, a paper by Nicholas Courtois which um, spoke about uh, the eventual self destruction of Bitcoin due to a lack of fees being able to support miners, and it inspired me to suggest, hey, what if we actually had like some sort of perpetual emission so that miners are always supported regardless of, um, you know, fees and, and whatever like fee market exists. Um, and, and so like I made, I made that, that, uh, I, I, well, invent is probably the wrong, the wrong term, but like I created the idea, I spawned the idea of a tail emission. So obviously I'm going to want a tail emission on Atari as well for the exact same reasons that I wanted it on Monero in the first place. Um, but beyond that, like I have no, um, no, no ideas about what an emission schedule should look like. Should it be flatter than Monero's? Should it be steeper? I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it should be steeper. Maybe you want to get more out there early on. I don't know. I have no clue. Um, but this is the sort of thing that what has to be done. Are you going to are you going to use to kind of come to that decision? So th that that's a great question. So the process is. At some point, I mean, like right now, we're kind of focused on making testnet stable. But as we sort of get to the point where testnet is stable, we're going to have that discussion. We're going to like take it to the community and say, "Hey, look, this is like like this is what Fluffy Pony thinks it should should do. This is what Kale thinks it should do. This is what Naveen thinks it should do. Like, you know, yes, some ideas for for how it could work. What do you all think?" You know, like start to start to gather gather feedback and start to come to some sort of loose consensus, some broad consensus. It's the way we make decisions in Monero. It's the way we're going to make decisions, uh, or the way we do, and we'll continue to make decisions in Tari. Yeah, um, and another thing um, I would say is that I, I think a, a story that may exist out there for some folks is that you know there's a a certain way that everything must occur you know it's like oh tari labs you know as a company you know whatever has to do it this way there has to be you know this prescribed notion of how how emission curves work or emission schedules work um related to um you know projects like this and that's not at all how the Tari community operates. You know, the, the way the Tari community operates is you say, okay, well, what are what are different ways to align interests? What are different ways to, um, you know, create something that is going to earn trust over the long term? You know, has a shot at earning trust over the long term. Um, how can we be creative? How can we also have fun with it? You know, how can we have fun with this so that it's um, something that everyone's enjoying collaborating on together? Right? You know, we we spend so much of our time. Uh, you know, working on things. How do we how do we create something that is useful, aligns interest in the right way, and has a shot at earning trust over the uh, over the long term, and also is um, is a positive contributor for things we deeply care about, like Monero, etc. And so we're early stage in all of these sorts of discussions. You know, there's no grand plan. Like, oh my gosh, we're gonna do it this way, you know, we're going to replicate exactly what this project did in the year 2017. This is how it's going to be done. That's just not how we operate. It's, it's very much like, okay, well, the, the foundation, foundational system for Tari, the Tari protocol is a Mimblewimble implementation written in Rust. Can, can a group of contributors build that? Yes. Okay. There is a early version of that that now exists. Okay, we don't think that the majority of, of non-crypto people 
understand how cryptocurrencies work. How can we obfuscate as much as possible? Yeah, just as much as possible. Okay, well, we have this Aurora wallet thing. Well, okay, these are some early ideas, early thoughts on how we might be able to do that. And then, okay, eventually we'll have a conversation about a mission curve and you know the economic design, economy design and all these sorts of things. It's just not there yet. So um, our, our hope is that people will be open to having that discussion and, you know, be positive and, and, and open-minded with us because you just don't know. So I guess uh, final question, what, what's your current take on Monero? How are you guys feeling about Monero these days? I mean, I'm- Monero project, everything. What's, what's the Monero take? I'm I'm immensely positive on on everything that Monero has accomplished. I I must say I'm I'm a little bit disheartened by um, uh, you know I, like like what's his one of the the Winklevi, Winklevoss twins um, had a had a, a tweet. Um, it was Tyler Tyler Winklevoss had a tweet and I'll actually just pop it up here. I think I know what you're talking about. You're yeah, talking it's about. it's the one about um, his you know. Uh, his fear is that pandemics will be used um, to justify overreaching policies. Yeah, okay, we've been talking about that for months. Uh, welcome to the conversation, Tyler. And then he's like, crypto can provide a counterbalance to this. Zcash, a privacy-centric version of Bitcoin, can help users fight back, blah, blah, blah. Then he mentions Brave Browser and Orchard, of all things. I mean, come on. And and it's it's frustrating to me because I feel like... Um, like and I don't know how to I don't know how to put this in, in in words easily without sounding like a bit of a douchebag, but I feel like Zcash has bought legitimacy from some people, if that makes sense. Um it's it's not maybe they haven't gone out and physically paid people money, but like the people that that claim that Zcash is superior, they're not claiming it's superior they're not saying zero knowledge proofs as implemented in Zcash are a great privacy technology. They're saying Zcash is great. I have a fundamental problem with that. I mean, half a percent of Zcash's emission is shielded. Half a percent. It's like, can you imagine if Monero was like, oh, well, you know, everything's traceable, but half a percent is untraceable, guys. This is really private. You know, I mean, that's like, Half a percent of internet connections are untraceable today. You know, like, what are you, what are you talking about? It's like, it's a meaningless stat. That's like the, the 99.5% of it is totally traceable. That's the bottom line. And I get immensely frustrated when anyone, um, you know, I, not bag holders, but anyone who should know better or should have hired someone to tell them better. Uh, goes and praises something like that because it's just why it's do you silly. Think we continue we continue to see see that i mean is it is it just because like you're saying, there's, there's interests otherwise and those interests are strong well, well let me let me let me put it this way it. let me put it this way why did tyler Wink, winkel winkelvi <laughs> why did tyler winkelvoss point to brave browser and not tor i mean you'd think if you're talking about taking your privacy back you would be like, hey guys, you want to take your privacy back when browsing? Use Tor browser. It's a download that automatically gives you a browser connected to Tor. Instead, he, he shows Brave that has like a scan token built into it. That makes no sense whatsoever. So I would say one of two things is true. Either these are people that have invested in the project and are, are thus uh, motivated because they've got skin in the game. Or there is like something else happening where these projects are like they they end up being viewed as somehow more important than the open source thing, than the you know community source thing, than the the, the grassroots thing. But the reality is, anyone who's serious about privacy when they are using the internet is using Tor. Anyone who is serious about privacy when they are performing a financial transaction is using Monero. It doesn't matter what Tyler Winklevoss thinks. That's the reality. Yeah. Suck it, Tyler. <laughs> I think, um, 
and we're sitting here uh, on the eve of, uh, you know, the, the Patriot, Patriot Act just getting renewed um, in the United States. And now with this like special edition where, you know, now the, uh, the apparently the FBI can uh, collect, you know, essentially records uh, from web browsing and search histories uh, without a warrant now. New power. It's like, uh, it's like being a magician at Hogwarts and you've just, you know, learned a new, a new spell. Here's a new spell, you know, for the FBI. And so I, I think that projects like Monero uh, grow in importance every single day. You know, every day uh, Monero's importance grows. And I think that, that the challenge, as I said earlier in this conversation, is how, how do you educate people? How do you really broaden the pool uh, of people who are interested and excited about Monero? That's the real question. And obviously that's one of the questions we hope to answer one day uh, at Tari Labs. Um, that's one of the core goals of the project. Um, so I, I think personally, I, I, I think Monero uh, continues to be the most important project in this space. Um, I personally would love to find more ways for us to contribute to the project over time. Um, and, you know, I'm incredibly bullish on, on Monero uh, adoption because I think as, you know, as social contracts continue to be broken, I mean, really that's what this comes down to. It's like social contracts continue to be broken. Now we have this unlimited money printing thing, right? Like, U.S. government has literally said they will print an infinite number of dollars. Unlimited. Why do people in the United States pay taxes then? What's the point? If they can just keep printing, what's the point? Right? Like, that's a social contract that's been broken. The, the Patriot Act was originally supposed to be a temporary thing. Right? It was a temporary thing post 9-11. They said, okay, hey, we need to, you know, suspend some freedoms to... Uh, to 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 go after terrorists. Okay, right. I, I don't. I disagree, but okay. Now here we are, twenty years, almost twenty years later, and not only is it being renewed, it's being expanded. It just doesn't make sense. So so uh, yeah. So you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I, I think that um, these are the, the reasons why, for me as an individual, I think Monero's importance continues to grow, and I just want to find ways to grow the pool of people who are aware of Monero, who understand how to use Monero, who are making um, <clears throat> informed decisions about using Monero, um, that are, are looking at Monero as digital cash. Like this is a means of exchange. This is a medium of exchange. That's what this is. That will guarantee your privacy at a meaningful level. Um, so so that, that's, that's my opinion on, on sort of where we are as a, as a community. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm doubling down on Monero by running for Congress. I don't, I'm sure you guys, have you heard? Have you heard? So I mean, yeah, I'm heard. making that a big part of my platform. Uh, that's a big part of who I am, my beliefs, and why I'm uh, so enthusiastic about Monero all the time. I, I really do think it's about preserving liberty in the digital age. Uh, yes. You know, so don't, don't need to preach to you guys, but... Uh, you know that that's that's why I'm so excited about Monero all the time. These the, the digital cash, now you know digital cash, not because it's allowing me to whatever uh, buy something on the internet, but because it's you know free speech money. Um, and as we transition, you know we're seeing it with Corona, right? I mean now everybody is online. Everybody was already online, but now we're like really all online. I mean everything's online. You know everybody's zooming. Everybody's and so we're, we're entering this stage where, you know, we're, as we transition into the digital age, how are we going to continue to preserve these rights? And it's, it's not just about, you know, a constitution anymore. It's about needing technology that will allow those rights to be preserved. Um, and I think Monero uh, plays that better than anything else right now, even uh, better than Bitcoin, in my opinion. And so I, I'm hoping to to really express that and you know if, if I win you know really kind of bring that fight to the floor of Congress because you don't really hear people talking about it you know you hear people talking about Bitcoin obviously everybody understands they get Bitcoin but then when the hard question always comes of oh well uh, you know terrorists use it you know uh, what, what are you gonna do about that and it's like, actually don't worry about it uh, don't worry about it congressman 
uh, yes, uh, terrorists may use Bitcoin, but you know it's a traceable ledger, so we could we could we could find these terrorists with no problem. Instead of the argument being, well, actually, Congressman, you know, it's it's this is about free speech, um, and you know, kind of getting into that argument, right? And so I think with Monero, you're going to have to start to see that argument being made as to why uh, we need to protect this technology. Uh, and not kind of scoff and say, "Oh yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, it's it's free speech money until you don't no longer need it to be." Uh, but you argue on a fundamental level on why those things are important, and that goes all back to you know what, what this country was built upon. So that's that's. that's I why think I'm so uh, excited about Monero right now. I'm so excited that you're running. Uh, I think it's amazing, and I think uh, you know, huge fans of you and, and want to support your your. Um, candidacy in any way we can. I think um, just another, just a layer into the point you just made, it's there's so many slippery slopes out there, right? And, and it's so easy um, as, a, as a, you know, legislator, as, as a lawmaker to, you know, pass laws that at that point in time seem reasonable, right? Like the Patriot Act is a great example. Like at that point of time, it seems reasonable but you have to think forward. You have to say, okay, well, wait, you know, how often are these laws actually repealed? You know, once something is in the bag, it's so hard to get rid of it, right? It's, it's like a ratchet. You just keep ratcheting it up and you keep going, you keep going and you keep going. And then you can it's so hard to pull it back. And that's the problem. You know, that's the problem. And, and you're right. It's not really a constitu constitutional question anymore. I mean, we have the fourth amendment, but no one seems to really care, um, and, uh, and and no one is out there really fighting for that at the level that they probably should, and that's why these laws continue to be passed. And also, people take these things out of context because guess what? They were written prior to any of this stuff existing, right? So it's really difficult. It's so difficult to translate language that was written, you know, hundreds of years ago into stuff that's relevant today in today's society. And so, but it's scary. It's really scary what's happening out there with all of these slippery slopes. You know, it's like people carry cell phones in their pockets. People, you know, they have GPS tracking on, you know, the carriers that your phone are connected to, it's tracking locations. And everyone knows that stuff can't be anonymized. Come on, because humans are, are, are creatures of habit. We do the same things over and over and over again. And you can easily ascertain who the person is based on their pattern, right? So, and and not everyone is James Bond, right? Where they learn, they're a spy and they know to change their pattern every you know so often to throw the sniffing dogs off the trail. Like that's just not how people operate. So, I think I think again, Monero as a foundational technology, a foundational financial infrastructure um, element is very important. And it's important in terms of how it was born, um, you know, the, the trust it's earned over a long period of time, um, you know, the, the, the fact that it's default private, the fact that people are pragmatic, all the developers who are contributors who are working on Monero, there's a strong degree of pragmatism there. So, so many reasons why it's an important project. And I, I, I only hope one day in the relative near future that there's more awareness for it and People really view the strengths, right? It, again, as you pointed out, so easy to say, like, oh, well, this negative thing happened with US dollars. Okay. Someone brought a suitcase of US dollars and did something bad. Okay. Someone used Bitcoin in the same way. Someone may have used Monero in that same way. But you, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can't, it's like, we're not all bad apples. You know, it's like law enforcement has lots of wonderful tools to use to track people who are doing nefarious things. And by the way, on ramps and on ramp, off ramps uh, into sort of digital currencies are, are very well regulated for a reason. And that's great. So I, I think there's a lot of confusion out there, but I think we're missing the plot you got to focus on the slippery slope issues and we just keep sliding down the slope. We just keep doing it as a society and that's a real problem. All right, guys. Where, uh, so I guess where can people uh, learn more about Tari? 
Atari.com. <laughs> Twitter.com forward slash Atari. Visit now for lots of lovely tweets and memes. <laughs> Thank you for having us. You're too good at that. Thanks for coming on, guys. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, Doug. All right. See ya. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.